Input and output are the two most important ideas when it comes to any type of system. Given some input, the system should react a certain way and yield a predefined output. We saw this idea at work in the Introduction to Digital Electronics course when we were introduced to D flip-flops. When we pressed a button, the D flip-flop registered it and set the output accordingly. Similarly, when we released the button, the D flip-flop again registered it and the output LED turned off. A microcontroller operates in the same way when it comes to input and output, with the main difference being that the software we will write will be in charge of sensing the input and setting the output. The ATmega328 microcontroller is capable of digital input and digital output, as well as analog input. And as you can see here, the many digital and analog pins of the microcontroller are all assigned an identification number, like digital 2 or analog 4. The different types of input available can correlate to many different types of output. For a simple example, if I press the start button on a stopwatch, this should start a digital counter displaying the current count value. This type of system is a one input, one output system. More complex systems will have multiple inputs and multiple outputs, where the correlation of how the inputs affect the outputs is less clear. An example of this type of system is a car. An embedded microcontroller inside of the car looks at many different sensors and sets outputs on your dashboard like time, speed, tachometer, and gas. All of those outputs are affected by different inputs on your car, and some use a combination. For this lesson, we want to create a one input, one output system. This means that given one input, the output should react a certain way. The one input will come from a push button, and the one output will be from an LED. The hardware side of this experiment will follow this familiar schematic, but let's build it up part by part like we did in lesson two. First, we have the power regulator circuit. This is with a nine volt battery, a 7805 plus five volt regulator, and two bypass capacitors, and finally, a resistor plus LED to notify us that power is good. The basic ATmega328 connections remain the same, with one going to plus 5 volt power and two going to ground. For the reset control circuit, we use a push button connected to ground and pin 1 of the microcontroller. Then a pull-up resistor pulls pin 1 up to plus 5 volts. The USB to serial programming circuit connects TX to RX and RX to TX of the microcontroller, then ground to ground, and finally DTR connects to a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, which connects to pin 1 of the microcontroller. The frequency control circuit consists of the 16 MHz crystal and two 22 picofarad capacitors. The crystal connects to pins X1 and X2 of the microcontroller. The last portion of the circuit is the LED output and push button input. The LED output consists of a resistor and LED. Pin 13 connects to the resistor, which connects to the LED, and then the LED goes to ground. The push button connects to pin 8 of the microcontroller, and then to ground. A pull-up resistor is added to pin 8 to make sure that the microcontroller always sees logic 1 unless the push button is pressed. And that's the hardware schematic. So now let's take a look at the software side. Just as we saw last time, we start building our program with the setup and loop functions. Since we have one input and one output this time, we need to initialize them both appropriately inside the setup function. The pin mode function allows us to declare a digital pin either as an output as we saw in the previous lesson or as an input as you see here. Then, inside the loop function, we will first use the digital read function to read if pin 8 sees a logic 0 or a logic 1. That will be stored in the integer called button state. And now, we'll test the input using a conditional if else statement. We test if the button state integer is logic 0, which means the button has been pressed. Then turn the LED on. Otherwise, turn the LED off. Since pin 8 input 
has a plus 5 volt pull-up resistor, the input will always read a logic 1 until the push button is pressed. And when the push button is pressed, pin 8 will be connected directly to ground, and so input will be read as logic 0. This type of if-else statement is very common in Arduino programming, and you should spend some time after this lesson to make sure that you understand how it works by modifying this program and seeing the results. We just saw the schematic that we're about to build, but let's go through the parts one by one just to make sure we're all on the same page. The parts we'll need to build the hardware side of this experiment are a jumper wire kit, the parts kit, and a breadboard. Specifically from the parts kit, we'll be using one 7805 plus five volt regulator, two 100 ohm resistors, two 10 kilo ohm resistors, one 0.1 microfarad capacitor, two 10 microfarad capacitors, two push buttons, an AT Mega 328 microcontroller with Arduino compatible bootloader, a 16 megahertz crystal, two red 5 millimeter LEDs, two 22 picofarad capacitors, a 9 volt battery connector, four jumper wires, and a USB to serial converter with jumper wires. With all the parts gathered together, now we'll construct the circuit as we saw it in the schematic. We'll use a time lapse so that you can follow our construction process part by part. And finally, we'll add the four jumper wires to connect the USB to serial converter to the circuit so that we can program the microcontroller. Now power up a laptop and load the program that we wrote earlier into the Arduino IDE. Click the upload button and it will work its magic uploading your program to the AT Mega 328. And now when we press the push button, the LED turns on because the microcontroller senses the input. Taking a quick look at the schematic and code again, in normal operation, this 10 kilo ohm resistor makes pin 8 C plus 5 volt input or logic 1. Then looking at the code, when pin 8 is logic 1, the LED should be off. When the push button is pressed down, however, pin 8 sees 0 volts or logic 0. Looking again at our software, you can see that when button state is logic zero, the LED should be turned on. Let's have some quick fun and swap the output high and low states around, changing the software so that a button press turns the LED off. So go ahead and upload it and give it a test. And now, as you can see, everything is backwards. Wahaha, we are magicians. In the real world, we see and use single and multi input and output systems every day. ATM machine buttons, gas station buttons, soda machines, and calculators are all systems with both single and multiple inputs that influence some type of output, whether it's giving you money or a soda. However, the output of these machines needs to be 100% precise, and so microcontrollers inside of them carefully assess the input you give to make sure they give you exactly what was ordered. All parts in this online course were provided by the Gadgetory. Visit them at gadgetory.com slash pyroedu. The type of input and output we just learned about is often referred to in the embedded systems world as general purpose I.O. It's a basic necessity, but only offers us basic functionality. So continue on to the next lesson where we explore how to use timing and timers to create perfectly timed output from a microcontroller.